Hey, welcome to Divinely Uninspired. This is Rusty. I'm here with Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, how are you doing today? Good. And uh, we also have sitting with us today, Jamie, Jeremy's wife. Hey, Jamie. Hey. How are you? I'm great today. Good. Hey. Shut it. Yeah. I'll have to EQ this so that uh, I've actually got it EQ'd for a, for a lady's voice. So your, your voice you sounds nice. You need one nice. for a child's voice. I, I can do that too. That would probably be more appropriate for me. I'm excited about having you guys here together because uh, I like your all's, your dynamic is a lot of fun. So uh, it's, it's a lot of Jeremy making fun of Jamie and Jamie just rolling her eyes. So, which. Uh, That's it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got a great show for you today. We're really excited. Um, this is episode two, and uh, the response after episode one was really good. A lot of you seemed to really enjoy it. Um, we got a few notes from people. Uh, we need to go longer. They told us we were short. Yeah, they said we they wanted more of us, which was surprising. So yeah, that yeah. is surprising. Uh, but I, I'm glad they want more, and so we'll try to do our best to give a little bit more. We got a great show, but before we get to that, we got to hear our theme song. Enjoy. Here we go. One, two, or one, two, three, four. You're listening to Divinely Uninspired, a podcast by Journey Church Shepherdsville, hosted by Jeremy Willis and me, Rusty Wilson. You can find us online at journeyshepherdsville.com. For questions or comments, email podcast at journeyshepherdsville.com. Maybe we'll feature your question or comment on a future episode. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. All right. So uh, Jeremy and I, just this past week, we took a a trip um, that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, to Guatemala. Um, It was my first time. I'd never been. Uh, Jeremy, how many times have you been at this point? That was my third trip to Guatemala. Okay, very good. And Jamie, have you been yet? No, I haven't got to go yet. Do you want to go? I do. Okay, very good. It's a, it's a really, really cool country. Um, we, we were only there for about four days. Um, if you don't count travel, it was like two days. But, but it was two jam-packed days. Yeah, it was. It felt like more than just four days. Yeah, first the first day felt like three days. It was a lot in one day, and it was uh, it, it was a whole lot of work. <laughs> it was, and I preached for my first time in Guatemala, and preaching through a translator is it was interesting. I didn't realize that was your first time preaching down there. Well, I'd preached in Honduras before, but that was my first time in Guatemala. Got it. Got it. They were uh, they were very receptive. Um, Pastor Ventura, who we partner with, um, the first thing he said when Jeremy got done was, well, church was short tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which, to my credit, one of the ladies said we should have him back because he was short. Yeah. 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 Well, it was great. It was really, really good. And uh, worship was interesting. It was fun. Um, it was a cappella. Um, it was a lot of clapping on one and three and. Um, it was hard to keep a, a good rhythm. I don't even there. know what that means. That would be like one and two and three and four. And yeah, so <laughs> it's 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 a very difficult, uh, it, it just means that they weren't on any sort of timing. Oh, I thought you meant they were like expert level. Oh, no, 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 no. Gotcha. There, there was, there was uh, it was amateur hour, but it was fun. Jesus was praised. So uh, what that else was can good. we say? But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we got all kinds of fun buttons this that we get so to push. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> this is Jamie's first time doing a podcast. So y'all, if you could see this, Rusty's got the setup. It looks legit. It's like a spaceship. There's yeah. a lot of buttons and colors and, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so, um, Jamie, I, I wanted, wanted to know though, what is it like? I found out from my wife what it's like at our house, but what is it like when Jeremy's not home and you're flying solo? Well, actually, it's funny that you ask. It has changed a lot over the last couple of years. Um, it's not as exciting as what you guys are doing. But um, I told Jeremy, this is like the first time that when he was gone, I missed him, not just the extra pair of hands and the extra person to help me with the kid. So we've come into this new era where my kids are more self-sufficient and we can go do fun things. And I don't want to like cry every night. Yeah. Well, that's really sweet. And Jeremy, did you miss Jamie that much? I did. I didn't miss her. So I did get a couple texts and the service is real bad down there. And so there were several times where I had my phone and she would send me these nice messages and I may not get them for several hours or reply to them for a while, depending on where we were in the country. Yeah. And she'd be like, did you not like my message? It was so sweet. And I'll be like, well, yes, it was. I just didn't get a chance to reply for several hours. But oh, or several days, you know. 
Well, there was only one. <laughs> she sent it to me. I didn't reply to the next morning because we fell asleep. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. Well, and we were two hours behind. So yes, it the was, time was kind of weird. And in the service, I mean, in Guatemala City, it wasn't bad. Um, but once we got out to where we were, a village called El Reparo, and uh, uh, we were actually just outside of that um, in another village uh, called uh, Tiki Santa. Um, but uh, the service there was horrible. And most every message I sent would give me that little red mm. exclamation point when this was not delivered. Yes. And T-Mobile claims to be there, but um, my service said otherwise. But no, I missed my wife. It, I missed her. Well, good. That's the that's the headline yeah. is that you missed your wife. How'd the kids do? They did good. And that was another thing. They did really well this time too. Um, we stayed really busy and I planned lots of fun things. So that was helpful, but it was a, it was a good, good little week. Good. How did you, did you enjoy your souvenirs? Oh, Yes. Yeah, they're almost all gone. I got chocolate and then my hammock. Yeah. I've been laying in that. I read in it yesterday. Very, where is it? Where do you have it? Do you have it on it's your deck? It's to or? our tree, to our swing set. Oh, nice. Not in the yard. I just took all the swings off of our swing set and set ours up there. So we mm-hmm. don't have a swing set anymore. We have a hammock set. I but like it. Yeah, it works. It works pretty well. And uh, you got uh, you got packs and a dress. You got packs right? and a dress. And Elliot, I'd got him stuff before. <laughs> a knife, right? No, a I was going to get him a knife. Like, so I didn't think Jamie was going to sign off on getting him a knife. And but after, I okayed it. She okayed it. But at that point it was too late. So I ended up getting a little Miles Morales, like stuffed doll or whatever. But there were some sweet knives down there. They were like crocodile, crocodile Dundee, Rambo. Some of them had like uh, brass knuckles on them. Like, so if you ever want a knife, you need to go to Guatemala because they don't mess around mm, with their knives. No, no. I, I'd carry it on my belt if I, if I got one yeah. back, like through TSA, cause I have TSA pre-check. Yeah. That's and something the legit could carry a knife I, on the belt. I don't know, I, but they might. I mean, it, I, I'm not a threat according to TSA pre-check, but let's talk about that for a minute because, um, our, our travel down was really, really easy. I mean, it was uh check in, you know, make sure that we have our COVID vaccine stuff, which they didn't even really It was bizarre. It was so weird. And I'm not trying to get into a thing, but it was weird that Guatemala would accept our COVID vaccine certificates, but America would not accept it coming back in. So we had to have a COVID test actually before we came back into the country, which wasn't bad at all, but it was just one of those weird things. Like, yeah, I don't understand why they will accept my COVID vaccine, which is given to me in America. Right. But America won't accept the COVID vaccine, which they asked me to get. Yeah. Uh, it, was a weird, it was just a weird it, thing, it, but it, 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 it was fine. It was, yeah. And uh, it, they literally like just glanced at the, oh, yeah. I, I could have just handwritten Rusty is negative for COVID and they would have been like, all right, that's cool. And just put a signature down. They this didn't works. Yeah. really check it. No. And you got your first nasal swab test. I did. I'd done the spit test before, which was great, but I did the nasal one and it wasn't bad. I mean, it, the, the lady was very nice. Very, yeah. She had kind eyes. It was she, very, she very did. nice. That, that was, was the only thing we could see over yeah, there. Yeah, that was the only thing we could see because we had to wear masks again the whole time. The whole time. So, yes. But she was very gentle about the process and it, it just tickled. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sam, uh, he's, he's one of the missionaries that lives down there. Um, shout out to Sam. He told us that if you don't wear your mask in Guatemala, they will arrest you. Yeah. So, oh, wow. um, it, it's a little, little stricter than what we have here in Kentucky. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but anyways, so it was, it was a really good trip. Um, but the Atlanta airport was an absolute nightmare. It is the worst. I have, I've had several trips through Atlanta and I always have issues in Atlanta. In fact, on our honeymoon, we were in Atlanta and got, uh, they put us on the plane and, uh, and no, I'm not- we had to take our luggage to a giant room and they're like, just throw it in there. Yeah. And it was just a big pile of luggage in a room. And I was like, what? And needless to say, it did not make it home with us. Yeah. We had to go get it like the next day, which is similar to kind of what we had. I mean, we got off the plane and we were in customs. We had two, what, two and a half hour, two and a half hour layover yeah. and we barely made our plane. I mean, we were in line and it was like, it was the longest line I think I've ever been in in my life. I can honestly say that. It was, it was crazy. Um, and, and everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's wondering why are there only half the, the lanes open? Um, and they, they like to, the agents there, they like to fuss at you that, that you're in the wrong line or you're, you're, you're not standing close enough to the person in front of you. Or you're standing too far away from the person in front of you. Um, it, it's, it, it was an interesting deal. And the guy that we got, he wanted to make friends with everybody <laughs> Yes, he did. that came through his lane. I, I mean, yeah. it was, we had people that were like two queue lines behind us that made it through before we did. Yeah. And the worst part was I had to pee. I had to pee as soon as I got off the yeah. plane. And if you're not familiar with when you come through customs, they don't know have bathrooms before you go through customs. Like, I don't know why they didn't think to do that, but they don't. 
and there's right, a reason. Right I'm next sure. to the line because you can was, swallow the balloons. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> right, yeah, right next to the. I don't think that's what you do with balloons, right? I, I, I think I, it's a different thing. Well, I think. But so anyway, too. Uh, I don't even know what y'all are talking about. Well, you don't want to yeah. know. So, but right next to the bath, the the line was a bathroom, but he wouldn't let us go. No. And so for like an hour and a half, I'm just being tortured because I have to use the restroom so bad. And it's right there yeah. and I can't get through it. But then the crazy thing is once you get through the line, they won't let you use that bathroom. You have to go to another bathroom, which is in baggage claim, which that was a nightmare yeah. in and of itself. I'm convinced that that bathroom is only for the customs and border agents. It must've been. Nobody was, else. I mean, there were people that would get out of the line and go run to the restroom and then come back into the line. Uh, if they had like a family member that could hold their place. But the best part was I got to see Jeremy's patience level. Um, which wasn't very high. No. <laughs> uh, every time we would go through, you know, there's like eight or nine full line queues and they're long queues. Every time we would hit one, he would sarcastically say, oh, look, we're one line closer. And, and it was that way the entire way through. Yeah. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm patient until things don't make sense. And that line did not make no, sense at all. And that's when I lose my patience very quickly when it's very illogical what is going on. And that was a very situation where there wasn't a lot of planning. And it was just one of those things too, where it's like, if only there was a way to know that 10 planes were being dumped at the same time. Yeah. And they do because they have track records of all of that stuff. So for months, ahead, for of months ahead of time, why would you not have more agents there when you're literally dumping thousand people at the exact same time into the airport? Did yeah. anyone cut line? Uh, Cause I'm, then you would have seen him really go off. Yeah, no, I mean, people got out and then got back in. Um, Jeremy hates that in traffic when people like drive up on the edge and cut around. Mm, he can't handle no, it. No, I'm a rule follower. I'm a line, I'm a, I'm a line follower. I'm a rule follower. I'm a, if I go to a concert or a game, these are my seats. My wife is not, she likes to cheat as much as she can, but I just, I don't know why I just, I'm like that. I no, I'm, I understand because my, my feeling is if, we're all in the same traffic line. Why is your life more important? That's exactly what, what he says. What do you have that's more important than what I have? Yeah, exactly. Do? Yeah. And the people that get out and go, oh, but this is a whole different thing we were planning on talking about. But the people, I'm convinced the worst people in the world are the people that see the sign that says the lane is ending and just continue to drive all the way to the front. And then what they don't realize is they're making traffic slower because if that line's moving and now they've got to get over it, now they've just basically caused everybody else behind them to get there even slower. But and sometimes they didn't see the sign and then they're like, Oh, they oh. see the sign because well, there's like the 20 no, of them. I have definitely done that. And I feel like, Oh my gosh, people are probably judging me, but I just didn't well, notice. They, so judge you. Totally, totally they, were, judged you. they hated me. Yeah. Well, they're not good people is what we're just getting down to. If <laughs> yeah. you don't read signs, uh, but, uh, but yeah, we, we had a great trip. Um, we learned that, uh, uh, quesadillas in Guatemala are not what you might expect. Um, they feed us, uh, it, it's too much food. It's too much. It's, I mean, we're, and, and I say this, we're Americans. We eat a lot of food yeah. and it was too much. I mean, it was full meals, every meal. And then there's snacks in between. And it's just, we at one point just had to tell them and culturally it's insensitive because if they put food in front of you, you have to eat it. Yeah. And the good news this time was they let us fill our own plates last time. They didn't let us do that. And so I would be at like a dinner and they would just bring me, I mean, not even a plate, like a platter of food and set it down before me. And I would look at Sam and be like, do I have to eat all this? And he'd be like, mm -hmm. which yeah. you don't know for sure if he's telling you the truth, because Sam is a bit of a prankster. He is. He's a, he's a funny guy. He really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he is. But no, it's so much food that they'd go to Golden Corral and say, this isn't enough. When yeah, exactly. You, <laughs> so do they eat like that when they don't have guests? No, no. It's a cultural thing when they have guests, especially Americans or missionaries, they want to make sure that we're taken care of. And, but no, I mean, they would eat like the eggs and plantains and all that and beans and stuff, but the grilled meat and the, all the extra stuff and probably the portion size itself, they would not do if we weren't there. No, which that's good to know because nobody can live like that. No. But the quesadillas, they're these like, um, you know, they said, Hey, do you want, do you want some quesadillas? And this is day one. And we were still hungry by that point a little bit. Um, and we said, sure, that sounds good. Quesadillas. And uh, an hour later they come back with these, it, it looks like cornbread. Yeah. I mean, they're like a loaf of cornbread. Yeah. And it's, it's made of rice, which I don't know how they do that, but it, it's, it's a quesadilla, but it's not a quesadilla. It's like a, it's like a cake. So you eat it like, like cornbread? You dip yeah. it in your coffee. Yeah. It was, it was like a, a, a pastry. Almost. Is there cheese involved? There is a little bit of cheese in it. They said, oh, but okay. I couldn't taste I couldn't the cheese. Taste yeah, they said there are cheese, cheese, but it's not, it's that crumble cheese they use, which kind of has almost, I don't know how to describe the flavor. But it's, it's like a goat cheese. Like a creamy yeah, more creamy, than a... creamy, but they bake it into the bread. But what we were talking about, what's so funny about the quesadilla was, 
I could understand if like you're on the other side of the planet and you hear quesadilla and you come up with something like that. Yeah. But they're not that far from they, Mexico. They border Mexico. They border Mexico, which is kind of where we assume most case. Does the quesad- Mexico make their quesadillas like El Nepal? Well, no, case, Mexican food is different than Taco Bell. Right. So just go around El Nepal or wherever. But it's similar. Yeah. This was in a whole different category. This was no, there was no tortilla. There was no cheese except for whatever the, and no meat. And it wasn't grilled. Like it was bread. And so how they went so far with the exact same word in a different direction. Yeah, it was like a coffee cake yeah, almost. It was bizarre, but, but it was delicious. It was really good. They uh, they sent us each a loaf to go home. and um, I gifted mine to the hotel the last yeah, night. Yeah, I did too. My, yeah. it, it started to break up. It broke really easy. Yeah, and, it was um, just too much food. I feel yeah. a little bit let down by that. Well, right. next time we go, you can go with us and you'll get a whole loaf to yourself. Oh, we'll make sure let Ventura know you want a quesadilla and he'll bring you as many as you could possibly eat. Yeah, probably more than you'll want. Yeah, but anyway, uh, Guatemala is a, it's, it's a beautiful country. We spent some time in a in a city, very very old city called Antigua. Um, it sits at like the foot of a mountain, and uh, it's actually an active active volcano. Well, oh yeah, yeah it's actually a, yeah yeah. It uh, looks like a mountain to it, us. Yeah, right. But uh, but you know, there was no lava at that mm-hmm. time. I was really hoping because you said last time. Last time when we were eating there, there was actually lava spewing out of the volcano and it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we got to walk around this like 600 year old Spanish city. Um, it, and it still looks very old, but then you walk by this 600 year old building and there's a McDonald's inside and it looks all modern. It's very strange, but, but it, it was really, really cool. But, uh, we're going to be talking more about that partnership, that, that mission partnership with Hope Chest here in just a little while. But yeah, all in all, it was a great trip. Um, still battling Montezuma just a little bit. He, he got a hold of us. Mm-hmm. Um, we think we know what we ate. We're not positive. It's hard to tell. Cause you, sometimes you don't really know what you're eating. I mean, yeah. and, and they're, they really are very clean people. I mean, they're constantly, but yeah, you know, they tell you not to drink the water and, and that type of stuff, but something got a hold of us because yeah. all three of us. When we got back, we felt it. Yeah. Shout out to Dave Parkerson over at Church of the Crossroads. He was with us. Yeah. We'll have to have Dave on here sometime. Absolutely. Yep. He'll he'll have some more fun stories. They like to, they like to pick on Dave over there. Yep. So there's some stuff happening in, in the world that we were just going to talk a little bit about. Um, the first one is uh, the situation in Haiti with the, uh, the assassination of the Haitian president. Uh, have you guys followed that story at all? I have. And we were in, you know, Guatemala when that story broke. And obviously you've worked in Dominican Republic, which yep. borders Haiti. So you had a little bit more insight into it than, than I was aware of, but the situation's got crazy. I was looking today and now they're saying there's a DEA agent tied to it. Yeah. And there's also a, a doctor in Florida that God told him he was supposed to be the next president of Haiti. And so oh, wow. I hadn't seen that it's yet. crazy enough that you can actually, as a president of a country can be assassinated. I mean, when you think about like the security of our country and all right. that stuff, although our even our country has history, but th- that's still happening and they have access to the president in that way. But then there's been other details of the story come out that the actual assassination itself just makes it kind of a weird story. Yeah. I, I, Jamie, do you have any knowledge of this story whatsoever? Yeah, I think I was reading online that one of the odd things was that uh, only he and his wife were attacked, that no security people around them were affected or hurt or so it seemed kind of suspicious and that there were some mercenaries involved. I didn't even know that mercenaries still existed. I thought that was like, over. Oh yeah, that's a very much a real thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, still, yeah. They still are out there, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I did live in the Dominican Republic for a little while. Um, and, uh, a large population of, of Haitian people live in the Dominican. Many of them were never have never even been to Haiti. They were born in the Dominican Republic, but they're their first generation Dominican born Haitians. And, uh, uh, but almost every Haitian Dominican has family that still lives in Haiti. So it's a, it's a, it's been a pretty tense situation for several years. I mean, even going back all the way to world war two, the, the Dominican Republic, um, Haiti relationship has been, been pretty tense. Um, but, uh, yeah, just seeing this happen, I mean, gosh, Haiti just over the last, uh, last, 15, 20 years. It's just, really I mean, they've been, been through the ringer. ringer. I mean, it, and it's, and I did read in a little bit, just learn more. I mean, it's, it's the poorest Western country in the world, you know, and you hear a lot of the stuff going on and then you hear this happening and you're like, what's going to happen next down there? Yeah. And I know that we're going to have one perspective as, as Americans, um, you know, he, the president, uh, um, um, Moise, he, he was an authoritarian figure. Um, he was, uh, ha- fighting some battles over how much time he had left in office and, uh, um, 
he had some some workings with with some of the gangs uh, there in in Haiti and just kind of lost control. So uh, obviously we we don't want to see anybody assassinated, whether they're you know a good person or a bad person, and we don't certainly want to see a country in turmoil. But um, gosh, it, it's it's crazy what's going on down there, uh, and we've got some craziness that's that's happening here too. Um, maybe it's not crazy, but it's but it's different. Uh, there was a story this week that broke that you know we're in Kentucky where. Uh, the Creation Museum is, and the uh, the Ark, whatever they call that, the the Noah's Ark thing. Ark experience. The Ark yeah. Encounter. Encounter, yeah, yeah not yeah. experience. Uh, and and now they just announced that they are um, going to be building a Tower of Babel. Um, <laughs> I thought and, that's a bad thing. Well, that's what I thought. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. Well, the the, the you know, and this is neither here nor there. They're they're saying that they're doing it because they want to talk about. Uh, racism. And I'm not sure that's the best way to talk about racism. So what's the connection? Well, Jeremy, well, you're the, you're the old Testament guy. So why don't you take that? I mean, it, it's a weird story. I mean, when I first heard it broke, the first thing I thought was, and of course it, I'll be full disclosure and I'll try not to get into too much trouble. I'm not a huge Ken Ham fan. Um, I know some people may be listening, love Ken Ham and his work. I, me personally, there's some, I have some difference of opinions than him, you know, but his whole thing is answers in Genesis. And so they're building stories from stuff out of Genesis and Tower of Babel is an interesting story, but it's only nine verses in the Bible. And that story for me specifically, when I read it, there's all kinds of questions that come to mind, especially if you read the story, you know, they're essentially building a tower to make a name for themselves. And so God sees this and essentially they're wanting to be godlike as, as people. They don't want to be under the gods. So they're building a tower to the gods. And so God sees it. And, and even in the scripture, there's this weird kind of thing where God sees it and he's almost like surprised by it. And so he scatters the people and gives them different languages and all this stuff. So it's a very odd story. It makes me ask a lot of questions, but I also look at it and I go, man, there's so much other fascinating stuff that happens. I don't know if this is the the display that I would pick, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that was, you know, and I think too, like when I read it and I would be interested to see how they're going to address racism with it, if that's mainly their main goal, um, which is a noble thing to, to try to take oh, that yeah, on and from a biblical absolutely. perspective, for sure. Um, I'm just not sure how that's going to go together, how it's going to work. Um, you know, the, the tower of Babel for me, you know, more so it, it, those stories like that make me think of all kinds of questions. And, and I think as readers, we should, when we see these stories that are complicated for us and culturally even understand, we start asking questions, you know? And so for me, the big takeaway from that story that I always get is that, you know, it's this idea that these are people trying to build this tower to be like God. And essentially that's what we're still trying to do. We're still trying to be God-like. And so maybe the original writer is trying to address that that's within man and still is within man to be godlike to create our own thing versus being in line with what God has in store for us. But um, no, I'm, I'll be interested, but I do think it's a bad thing. The other thing is the tower wasn't completed. And so are they not going to finish the, yeah. I, it's I don't gonna know. It's going to be like 12 feet tall. And <laughs> I know, that's what I was there's wondering. How high did they get before yeah. they shut there's it down? There's a lot of questions that I would have about it. But I mean, you know, and like I said, I'm, I'm not trying to knock Ken Ham too much in what he's doing. And I've already upset some people, but that's okay. We can all disagree and still love each other. That's, that's right. a good thing. But it is, it is an interesting thing developing. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm a bit of a cynic, uh, when it comes to things like that's just my nature. Um, it's the way I was raised. I blame my mother. Uh, but it, it's, uh, I just see that and it's kind of like, Oh, yeah, they're probably going to get some money out of this. Um, people will go and see, I mean, I guess I would go and see it too. If, if it was, Oh yeah. You know. I mean, I, I still haven't been up there, but I, I, you know, the arc, see, that's what's fascinating is regardless of your views of the, the arc story and Noah, you know, to see the arc. And that's the other weird thing that I think of is the arc at least has like dimensions of how big it was. Right. We know very little, if anything about the tower of Babel, all we know is that they said, and this is a weird part of the story is they said, we must burn the bricks, you know, hard. We burn them is the way it's translated. So they, they burn the bricks extra and then they start building this tower. And so it's this weird, but they, we don't know how big it was, how, how massive it was. Obviously they didn't finish it. So how far along did they get was, you right. know, so it's just a fast, the arc, you know, is at least like, okay, like we know the dimensions, you know, we hear, you know, the stories of the animals and, but the tower of Babel is just interesting. Yeah. But anyway, uh, and then lastly, kind of something to, to talk about here, just, just for a, a minute, uh, there's an article that just came out. Uh, it, it's a years long survey done of the, the church in America. Um, and the, the survey found some pretty interesting results and it's that white mainline 
Protestants, so that you're thinking your your Presbyterian churches, your uh, Methodist churches, the 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 denominations, the mainline denominations, now outnumber white evangelicals, and uh, and then kind of a tag to that survey was they found that the category of nuns, um, not nuns like uh, Catholic nuns, but like people that claim no religion, oh, I have no any, yeah yeah yeah, no affiliation. Um, that number has shrunk, but this is the first time in uh, a really long time that the mainline denominations outnumber, uh, quote unquote, evangelical churches, which, I mean, that that's a loaded word. Right what now. is that? I was going to ask, what are, are we in an ev- evangelical church? You take that one, Jeremy. I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. We would be, we would be considered an evangelical church. Now we do not, I, I don't, and I always try to answer this one carefully. Um, I do not identify as an evan- evangelical in the way that most people would just, dis- I guess, describe that. Um, but we would be probably put in that category as an independent Christian church, so, an evangelical church. But is it ma- if you're not a denomination? No, then you're not just even that, even- because, okay. you know, Baptists and stuff like that, they would be considered um, evangelical churches. Your mainline churches, it, a lot of it comes back to Protestantism. A lot of it comes back to your connections to the Catholic church. I mean, a lot of the mainline churches are not Catholic because they want to be Protestant, but they're very identical Episcopals yeah. and stuff like that. So it's a lot of the older, I guess, type of thing, more traditional, you know, and I think what's interesting about that, you know, without, I saw the article, but without doing too much research into it is, you know, a lot of those mainline churches, you know, if your parents were Lutheran, you're a Lutheran. Now, whether you ever attend a Lutheran church other than Christmas and Easter, or you're Catholic or you're Episcopalian or you're Methodist, like more than likely a lot of those people, it's generational, like that's just how they identify themselves. Where with evangelical um, churches, you know, it is, it it is a new phenomenon too. I mean, that's the other thing about evangelical churches. It's actually very new in the world of the church. Um, we've grown up in it, so we don't think of it that way, but it actually is fairly new. Yeah. I mean, really 20th century yeah. invention. And really in the last 50 years, right. honestly. And so you don't have that long tradition that maybe, and I think too, because of the way things are going, people are actually leaning more to traditional, um, not in all their values necessarily, but an identity sometimes. And so it makes sense that some people would be going back to that or willing to identify as that. And then, you know, evangelicalism, and like I said, we can talk about that again another time. Or if yeah. you want to talk about it, we can have coffee over it. I don't talk about it a lot publicly, but um, there's reasons that a lot of people are walking away from that. And there's some very serious reasons and probably some right reasons that they are. Sure. Um, and so, I, you know, that actually kind of makes sense, especially in the culture we find ourselves. Yeah. And we're, we're in the midst of, you know, what, what they call the culture wars right now, um, which we, we are, have kind of always been in that um, in, in our lifetime, but it, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting because, because post COVID um, church attendance has been kind of all over the map. It really tends to, to depend where you're at. Um, and I, we, we talked to um, we mentioned Dave from church of the crossroads. And he said that, you know, that they've, they've seen numbers increase and some other churches that we know that have seen numbers decrease. And so it's just interesting, but uh, it, it, this is our way of saying, if you're not um, in person, please come be in person. We'd love to see you. Um, we, we like having you online. That's nice. Um, but it's, it's way better when you're able to actually be in community with people, be able to sit next to people, talk to people, that sort of thing. So, yeah. but um, anyway, so our main topic for the day uh, is mission partnerships. Um, we want to talk just a little bit uh, about Hope Chest. Um, you know, Hope Chest is, is the the organization that we just went to Guatemala with, and it's it's a unique model. The way that uh, they partner with with not just churches and pastors, but entire communities. And um, we've gotten to see some of the hands and feet of that, uh, having been in the village El Reparo uh, that we we partner with here at Journey. Um, but Jeremy, tell us a little bit about what, what Hope Chest is trying to accomplish and what we're doing with Hope Chest. Yeah. So one of the pills to me about Hope Chest, and we partner with Church of the Crossroads in Mount Washington, you know, Dave and John over there and their whole congregation is what was appealing to me is, you know, you hear about all these sponsorship programs, Compassion, World Vision, and we've done those programs. In fact, many of our people still have kids that they're helping, you know, throughout the world and third world countries and developing countries through Compassion and World Vision. But what was fascinating about Hope Chest was they don't pick random kids from random villages. They just kind of put it in a pile and you just pick one. The idea was that we would actually... Um, as churches, we are partnering with a specific village 
And so for us, you know, there's 140 kids in that village. Almost every single one of them is sponsored or friended is the model that they use. And so we help to make sure these kids get meals and programs and education and uh, medicine they need and vitamins they need and all kinds of stuff. But we have basically taken on a village and partnering with them to help them and, and to kind of become better, to become what they can become. And that's not like to make them an American village, but to actually just help them, uh, resource them. And so it's kind of a neat thing to think that we are investing in another community in the world and our, you know, we signed up for a 10 year partnership and you can go beyond that if you want, but to see, I mean, we've, we've only been there a year and I mean, it, I was blown away at the stuff they've already done in a year with the resources we're able to give them, but also with the help that uh, Hope Chest is able to offer them in the community. And really, you know, it's, it's this idea of the community has to take ownership of it or it's going to fail. So just because they're being resourced doesn't mean it's going to flourish. They have to take ownership of it. Right. It, it kind of the, they're working against that American savior model where mm-hmm. we, we go in and we fix all the problems. Um, we, we're, we're partnering. It's truly yeah. a partnership and trying to provide them some of what they need, but, uh, tell them about the, uh, the, the lights. Yeah. So that was one of the things we, we had, we had heard they were doing. And so, um, they, in the village, there were no street lights. And so in that village, when it gets dark and when it gets dark down there, it gets dark. Cause there's no, you know, like, I mean, there's electricity, but they use it sparingly. And then also there's no street lights. So if you're walking, if you're a young lady, or a, a, a child walking down the street late at night. Or even a, a married lady. Yeah. I mean, you're walking, you're walking, you know, in the dark. And so there was some stuff, some crime happening, some things happening to people as they were walking down these streets at night. And so what we did is, is we didn't do it, but Hope Chest through what we're able to help provide, they put up street lights throughout the city. And what they said was they actually need 60 in total. Uh, they said, we'll start with 10 and we'll help you get 10 and you need more. So you need to come up with the other five. So it wasn't like we're just going in there and doing it. They have to do it. And then they have to find the contractors. They have to find the people uh, in the community that will help do it. And so they have to take ownership of it to happen. But yeah, I mean, even, you know, we were there at night one night and just to be able to see the street lights and to see some light, um, you know, it's got to be a relief to those people that they don't have to be fearful um, that they can walk and it's not going to be pitch dark all the time and and they can walk. And if something was to happen, somebody might see something, um, and can help because they're they're not in the dark. Yeah, I don't. I've never been held up, so I don't know what that fear is. Jamie, have you ever been held up? Mm-mm. No, no. I yeah. always have that I had that guy, fear when I'm in the dark. I had a guy pull a gun on me a long, long time ago. Uh, it was a long time ago. It was when I was a delivery guy for a place called Jim Conti and Sons, and there was a guy pulled up to the truck, and he, he, I don't know what he thought I had in the back of the truck, and he pulled a gun on me and wanted to know what I had, and I was like. Dude, I got a bunch of inflates. Like if you want to go, machine. yeah, I got yeah. a snow cone machine and inflates. Like if you want to, if you want to try to get this, you know, seven hundred pound slide on your back, right. and take it, you you be my guest. But bud, you don't but, know what the street value of those. Yeah, are, so. who, who knows? But <laughs> yeah, I've only had a gun pulled on me once, and it was in the Dominican Republic. We were vi- visiting this mountain village, and um, as we were leaving town, um, there was like a a civilian's barricade type thing set up. Uh, and I was not driving. Uh, there was a, a lady that was driving the car with me and, uh, she saw that they were standing there with their guns and she was like, I don't know what I should do. Should I stop? Should I stop? And they're literally standing in the middle of the road. We were going to have to hit them. And it was like, yeah, please stop, please stop. And we, she didn't, she wasn't stopping. And the, the gentleman in the road, um, pulled out his pistol, cocked it and pointed it at me. And it was like, please stop the car. I do, I do not want to die. And then as soon as they realized that we weren't who they were looking for, uh, they let us go and they were very apologetic, but apparently there was, um, there was a, a bandit who was right. on the loose that they were trying to catch in any car they didn't recognize. That's, they were stopping it. And, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I didn't tell Leah that story until after Leah's my wife. I didn't tell her that story until after we were uh, no longer living in the Dominican Republic. She did not know for, for a good year. And she wasn't happy about that. She still likes to bring that up. Yeah. Pass in the past, honey. Let it go. All right. Uh, but we've got a lot of cool things that are happening with that partnership. Um, and there's still more kids that need to be sponsored. And so we will are friended. And so we'll talk more about that, maybe even on the podcast when that becomes available, but obviously on the stage or something like that. Yeah. And so, yeah. And it's a great partnership. And what's cool, one more thing about it is unlike other pro, like, so we, me and my wife, we actually friend a girl. So we help her with the program. 
and she was in line to get food when we were down there. And so I got to go up and give her a hug and say hi and ask and how she she's was doing. Thrilled she, about she was so <laughs> embarrassed that I recognized her. And then her she's mom, she's a teenager. Her mom she's made, hit that age. Her mom, this was because it's cultural. Her mom made her give me a hug and I took a picture with her. And for some reason down there, the kids do not smile in pictures. Now they could be as excited as can be, but they were not going to smile in the picture. And so there's like this picture of me, like this big grin and her looking like, I hate my life right now. Yeah. Jeremy kind of looks like a creeper in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this gringo with his arm around me? Yeah, but but she was really nice. I mean, she she did talk to me for a few minutes, and it was really cool to meet her or see her again and talk to her. But yeah, she it was a weird moment, kind of. That for is sure. cool though that yeah. you can like actually get to meet the people that you sponsor. Because yeah. so many times we sponsor kids before that I knew we would never meet, mm-hmm. but this is different. Yep. Yeah, and it was really yeah. I mean, it, it's a well-oiled machine down there. One of the things we were doing was um, getting each kid. Uh, an updated picture um, so that they could send those to their partners. And that's what part of what made it such a long day. Cause there was like 140 kids that each mm-hmm. had to have their picture taken, but it was really exciting to see how, how passionate uh, pastor Ventura is about it because he wants to see those partnerships continue to grow. He wants to see those friendships develop um, and, and for the benefit of, you know, not just the church there in El Raparo, but for the church, you know, globally. So it was a very cool thing. Um, we're going to talk more about some other mission partnerships that we have here at Journey Church in future episodes. Uh, just a, a quick little thing. We we do have a, a trip to the Dominican Republic coming up um, with uh, another mission group, Mission Zoom. Um, we're, we're pretty excited about it. We got a good team going down in October. After you described being held up there, that was good. Yeah, well, we're not going to that village. <laughs> So that village is up in the mountains. There we're, you go. we're staying, we're staying at ground level, uh, almost sea level. So and just safe. make it a quick layover in Haiti just for a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Port-au-Prince. Yeah. I, I think they said that's where we're going to, we're going to No, stay. they will not be doing that. I hope not. Well, Hey, that's our show for today. Thanks for checking us out. Uh, you can subscribe and, or follow. I think now they use the word follow. They don't even use yeah, subscribe they, they to subscribe. I think you YouTube follow. is subscribe and like below, subscribe yeah. below. Here, we're pointing to buttons. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but, but we, we really appreciate it. Uh, you can leave a comment, leave a review. Uh, you can send a question or comment to podcast at journey shepherdsville.com and maybe we'll see that and we'll talk about it. And, uh, unless you complain and talk bad about us and then we'll ignore it. Thanks. See you next time.